this PCTV special. I'm Carrie Saldo here with Bernie Avalli, who is the executive director of PCTV, has been for 20 years and uh, with the organization for almost 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's time to say congratulations to Bernie because he has decided to retire. Well, thank you for your congratulations. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. I wanted to start our, our chat by saying, uh, mentioning something that Sean Sayre said on Facebook when he was announced as the incoming executive director. And he thanked you for your, quote, years of leadership, mentorship, and perseverance. So what did he mean by perseverance, Bernie? What did it take to get PCTV off the ground and running? Because mm. you were not only, you know, longtime executive director, mm -hmm. but back in the 80s, you were a founding board member of this organization. Yes. Uh, they had started doing some preliminary things in 85, uh, which I didn't, I wasn't around for, I didn't witness. Uh, but in 86, uh, I went to an informational thing at the City Hall uh, about people who'd be interested in doing access TV again. And a few reasons I was interested in that. One of them, I was originally on, uh, worked for Channel 2 back in 1970, so I'd already done access TV but it was community access and not uh, the access that we have now. This is really, uh, it was community programming, not community access. Where you're actually in the community capturing city council, parades, a right. variety of events, graduations, right. yeah. you name it. At that time, the, the cable operator was doing it directly, and I got paid by the cable operator. Uh, I was probably all of 19 or 20 years old uh, to go out with a camera and record events in the city. Uh, and I often went out with Bob Burke, who was the executive director at that time. And uh, we, rec <laughs> we recorded uh, commercials, because it was for Warner Amex at the time, uh, and then just Warner it was called. Uh, and uh, we shot various uh, landscape pictures as we're driving, things like that, because at night we would play that back uh, on a uh, DJ program. So we did VJing uh, before on it was, the air. Before it was cool, before it was... It was in black and white. But so you were <laughs> with... people called in for music and we'd show <laughs> some scenes of that drive, driving around in traffic and... So, yes, it was. So, Channel 2, you worked Channel 22 also, yes. a commercial station for quite a while. But in the 90s, in the early 90s, what was it about what was happening here that made you decide to come and well, take part full time? Right. Well, like I said, I had some of that background, so I figured I could offer some assistance since I'd worked in uh, the original stuff and uh, then I'd worked in broadcasts. I figured I could offer my expertise uh, to do the access programming again. So. I decided to join and see if I could help them. So um, they thought that was good for them. <laughs> so uh, And clearly it has been. I mean, the station has expanded significantly under mm -hmm. your leadership. You went from one channel to mm -hmm. three. Right. Now you have three. You have right. separate city educational and then the access channel programming that right. you or I could put on as a member yes. of this community. No, that's, that, that's what it originally was. It was in one channel that basically was mostly... Uh, giving access to the community so they could do programming of interest to them. Yeah. Uh, plus, we covered a city council meeting and we covered, you know, various parades and things like that. Uh, so that single channel was on the air from uh, 89 continuously, maybe 90 on uh, going. Uh, but er the early part that I did was I was uh, one of the board members and, and later they made me uh, vice president of engineering. <laughs> Great title <laughs> with no money, <laughs> of course, because it was all volunteer. Sure. And I started uh, deciding which equipment to buy and what the structure of uh, the engineering would be like, at least to go out into the community and cover uh, what was going on. So that's basically what I did in uh, concentrated on. Uh, but we all worked on the, the language of the rules and the regulations and things like that. And... Uh, so it, there was about 25 people originally, and uh, not all 25 can show up at one time, so you sort of had this core of people, and they were made up of the executive officers, which was uh, Ed Riley, John Fuchs, uh, who was uh, the uh, administrator of the library at the time, the Antonian. And that's where we met, in the library. And that was where the, only, the first cable drop was actually made to make the ability for us to transmit. Hmm. which was lucky because the first program we ended up shooting was the 4th of July parade, which was one of the things that we decided 
that we would provide as the organization. Right. So we started providing uh, the recording and showing of that live in 1989. Talk about what it takes to produce a live event like that, because it's not just <laughs> show up five minutes before the parade no, and, and here we go. No. There's a lot of pre-production involved, right? Yes, uh, and it, it, it certainly evolved over the years because uh, when, when I did it as a single channel, I had less equipment and less people uh, and with less experience to utilize. So I borrowed a couple of friends from Channel 22 who came and helped us. But we did, right from the start, use community members uh, to be parts of that crew. Um, so I had a, a young woman that I trained at Channel 22 come, and she ran a hand, handheld camera in the street. So there's one camera in the street, and you have to have somebody that has some expertise and can hold on to something heavy for, for that, that length of time. Of time. <laughs> uh, so I certainly trusted her to do that. And uh, her name was Linda Merrick at that time. She's now uh, been married, but uh, her, Linda Merrick and her uh, father and her uncle, uh, two engineers from Channel 22, came and helped in the truck for the engineering. Wow. The rest of the crew was made up of community people, other uh, cameras. So I had three cameras only. And uh, Now, uh, compared to how many do you use for the 4th of July uh, shoot? We've had up to six or seven uh, that we've used now, and uh, now we've changed locations a few times from where we originally were. Um, that one had to be at uh, the library that year because they had been working on the park, mm -hmm. and they had been doing uh, changing roads. and So it came towards the library and went down 1st Street. So that was lucky for us because that's where we could transmit from. <laughs> so the cable came out of the window and uh, connected up to the U-Haul truck, and there we were doing the first parade, and the Reverend Durant was the Grand Marshal. And we have still one clip that remains of that original parade. Most of it's gone, but that one clip uh, remains of that. Pre-programming through the years, you know, you had your own show for a little while. You've appeared on... No, numerous programs of, mm -hmm. of others who have their programs here at right. PCTV. Um, and obviously, you know, you've expanded. You've added school committee in addition to the city council mm -hmm. and uh, the coverage of the parade events and things like that. For you, is there uh, a production that stands out to you as particularly memorable? Wow, that's hard because uh, there were a lot of very good ones uh, and a lot of very uh, complicated ones. Uh, Actually, the funny thing is, is uh, one of the most complicated ones we ever did, nobody really saw what on the air uh, because it wasn't designed for that. It was using the institutional network that the cable operator had already made agreement to uh, connect all of the municipal buildings. And that was so that the government could trade information without necessarily the public viewing, like a training seminar, which is exactly what it was. Okay. It was for the school system. And uh, I'm trying to remember how many schools were connected. I think at least six. Across the state. Uh, there might have been more. No, no, just within the city of Pittsburgh. Within the district. Okay. So they were all on. Each one of those schools were live with each other and could talk to each other. Oh, so they're having some sort of a conference or yeah, right. Got it. So it was a system-wide city of Pittsfield conference, and some presentation was being presented about safety and regulations by an administrator at the high school. And he was looking at seven monitors, or I think there was seven, there might have been more, of seven sites. And each one of those sites could ask and interact with him. Mm. So that was very complicated. <laughs> and uh, that was early on in what we did. But we've done satellite uplinks for the parade that have been very complicated. So uh, th there have been times where we've reached nationwide more than once. Uh, including using the newest of technologies we can use, the internet, uh, allowing us to stream to uh, various locations in the world. Mm -hmm. So we, and we have data from that, who was watching and when, how long, because you can track that with Where the, were you drawing viewership from? <laughs> some places were quite surprising, but we drew, uh, definitely drew uh, viewership from our, our sister cities, mm -hmm. the one in Nicaragua yeah. and, the, and Bellana in uh, Ireland. Uh, so they watch the parade every time we stream it in Bell and Ah. We definitely get them. But a lot of uh, what we used to call the snow people that go to Florida. <laughs> sure, and they uh, want to keep tabs on what's happening in the community. Makes we sense. had a lot of hits from Florida, Yeah. Uh, a lot of hits from Texas, uh, California, 
um, and places we wouldn't even thought of uh, in like Italy and uh, of course there is another sister city in, in Italy so it could have been them also as a I'm a little vague on that but we had like 60 different sites all over the world watching us and it was like kind of that's weird <laughs> and because uh, you, you can't predict who's going to watch it sure. so they just came onto the stream found the site and we're watching the fourth of july parade and then we asked them to tell us where are you watching us from so we got some of that feedback but there was also data that was coming from the service that we were propagating it with. And the availability of the live stream is just an, an, another example of ways that you've expanded through the years right. because previously it wasn't available online no, and now it is. It wasn't. Where that, did that decision come in? Well, it, some of that uh, ability came with equipment that we purchased. <clears throat> uh, some of the um, equipment that works in what we call master control that does the playback on the air. Uh, it's an integrated system uh, by the tightrope company that allows you to do various things. And one of them is to stream onto the web. Mm -hmm. So because you had that ability, you exploited it. Um, but we didn't do a whole lot of that. We only did it at certain times because we wanted that quality to be as good as the quality we per current, currently put on the air. Because even from 86, we, we were ahead of the curve in terms of quality that was required to be on uh, we, we looked at the broadcaster's quality and we matched or get, went greater than that. Because originally in 86, what was available for you to use for equipment, and this take you back, is uh, tube cameras uh, that the news people used. And tape. Uh, and tape, and videotape, <laughs> three-quarter inch videotape. And now the card's not even three-quarters of an inch, barely, right. that's, that and, you're recording onto. Right, and now that's the astounding thing, because you go, wow, you know, because now we're basically playing things on the air that aren't even playing any anywhere physically. Yeah. They're, they're, pl they're a mathematical formula, <laughs> <laughs> an algorithm that's playing uh, this math that represents images and sound uh, and all kinds of sync information in this little bitty card that, you know, goes into a camera now that's the size of a postage stamp or yeah. a hard drive or it's playing on basically a computer hard drive that's built into a rack. That technology piece, does it ever give you concern about the future of PCTV because you know you're you're being funded by 5% of the mm -hmm. cable revenues right. because yeah. they use physical infrastructure through the city of Pittsfield. Yes. So if yeah. that physical infrastructure goes away, yeah, where what does happens it go? to PCTV? Yeah, that's always a concern. That's a concern of all broadcasting, uh, and not just cable operators and not just access people because what will be the next thing who will be consuming and how they consume it has always driven the market on and who's going to watch what mm -hmm. uh, so when they have people saying oh i just watch things on a box you know off the internet well the internet has to be provided somewhere okay so you're going to be reliant upon some kind of wireless or wi-fi signal to be able to consume that who owns that now now, now this is how far we've gotten away from the original idea of of, com of television being free and the, and the public being the public airwaves. Yeah. Well, if you own all these little boxes, is it free anymore? I mean, you got to ask yourself that question. It's not really. And they've been trying to do that since 1934. Yeah, <laughs> right. Mean, they've, been, they've been trying to, to own what we looked at and how, the way we look at it since 1934 with radio. So, so does that give you some sort of hope that there will always be a next iteration. It'll change in some way. Yeah, I think you got to be really have your, uh, you know, your ear to the ground or whatever analogy you want to use and keep looking at what is going on for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because you do have to, at some point, adapt to that. Uh, because that is the way it's being consumed. Then who's watching you if, you, if they're not watching that? So, uh, and that is of a concern because we don't go out through the air. We're not a broadcaster. We're a cable caster. Uh, back in 86, everybody said, oh, you know, that, that, that cable stuff, that's closed never circuit television. <laughs> You'll never see it outside the city limits. Nobody's ever going to look at it, you know. Well, we already reached two other towns. We'd reach Richmond and Dalton anyway. Mm -hmm. So we were already reaching outside of that little box idea. And now we're reaching out on the Internet. We're reaching out. We can connect through anything and get to any place in the world. And I have to say the online stream is an invaluable resource to members in the community, including yes. myself as a reporter at the Berkshire Eagle, because there are times where there are two meetings going on at the same time right. and I can't get to both. And so right. I know that I can call you guys up and say, 
can I come look at the footage or watch it online? Right. It's, it's a really valuable resource. It is, and I think that's a very important thing we do in the city. Uh, beside giving the public a choice of their own local programming, certainly city meetings, which directly impact them, having to do with either school or the city in general, taxes and budgets, mm -hmm. They can view that uninterrupted, gavel to gavel. We don't edit them. It's not a sound bite on a news story on you know one of the Albany Channel broadcast channels. It's not a Channel 9 cut in. It is the entire program. Now, some people say, I'm going to sit and watch two hours. <laughs> Guess what? They do. Yeah. They do because they are seeing their people that are running their city and what their mannerisms are, what their attitude is, what their body language is. It's more than just reading a f little clip or listening to a sound bite that somebody decided and edited and selected and said this is the thing that you should listen to. Right, get, they get to observe the entire, right. sometimes excruciatingly slow process yes, of city government, uh, but it is important. It right. is important. Right, it is important. And, and I think on top of that is the city years ago asked us to provide them with a copy of everything. So we are actually archiving the hi city history and, and not just a legal document of what there's, because you can prove it's legal, because there is no interruption. Mm -hmm. So people have used that in court cases. Yeah, They've said, hey, I need a footage of the licensing board, blah, 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 wow. or what this counselor said. So unintended uses, yeah. Unintended uses, but the city keeps a copy and we keep an archive copy. That did not happen before that. There weren't any copies that before the 1980s of anything like that on video. Let's talk about, we'll shift gears a little bit. Let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the changes that have happened here. You've moved, you've expanded, and we're sitting in Studio K, Studio which, K. as I understand it, really was, was your baby. Talk yes. about the, the, how this came to be. Well, um, I guess you have to start with the old facility. The old facility was built by my predecessor, Garrett McCary, and, uh, who later hired Sean. So this is back in 80... Sean Sayre, who's going Sean to become Sayre. executive director. So he's been around for a while, too. Uh, uh, certainly has. Uh, he came out of Syracuse and right here uh, to work with uh, Garrett. And Garrett was the first executive director hired. I had departed the scene, and I wasn't working anymore with him. And Garrett and Sean built up the original system. They found another building besides the library to operate out of. They took the equipment that I bought, uh, and utilized it, which was some of the first equipment of its kind. Uh, basically, uh, I had a blank page when I started, and I found out the stuff that was being made with chips inside instead of tubes, and I purchased the ch three chip cameras that we used for many, many years. Uh, of, they were of broadcast quality, and they used SVHS, which is very much like component beta cam, so it was of the same quality in the recording. Even though it's still videotape, it was at least as good as three quarters or better, and you could buy more of them. Mm. So <laughs> we got more of them. So we were able to expand because we made right decisions about that, and we were able to use it for many, many years. Uh, we never went to beta cam. We were able to go right to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So having made those right decisions helped us in being very stingy about the money, kept our money present for us to spend it the right way, making good decisions always helps that. And so we went from that single channel with this blueprint of where we we're supposed to go because the cable operator wanted to move. They wanted to move from this small cramped area and expand. So Warner Cable decided to move and Time Warner, it became later uh, in the new franchise agreement, was going to move to a new building. Do you want to be in on it? So uh, while well, I inherited the plans that they already started, but I worked with those plans within that constraint we were given. So we got this sort of L-shaped portion in the middle of two businesses, Time Warner on one side and Shoppers Hotline on the other. So we're, ser we're sitting now currently in Shoppers Hotline's because space. Because you've expanded. Again. We expanded uh, yeah. later on into this space. So this is a new space. And when we expanded onto this, I'm going to jump back to, I'm trying to answer all your parts of your question. <laughs> when we jump back into this new space, uh, we got this big room we're in. And this was their control area. This is where they inserted cable uh, information that were shot locally or regionally into the cable lineup. Mm -hmm. So you watch a channel and instead of seeing the national spot, you saw the local spot. And they would insert those commercials in here. So what happened when they insert the commercials in here, they had to control it and watch the timing. So they had a big control room in here. 
and they have air conditioning and everything in this room. Because so, there's a lot of equipment, yeah. Right. So uh, we were across a hallway from where this is. And w so when they uh, left this building, this left all this open space with some offices out there and this big room. So when I saw this big room, I said, hmm, another studio space. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, it, it could also be conference room, uh, boardroom. Uh, it could be multipurpose. Yeah. All right. Because you're shooting, Studio K stands for kitchen. Yes. 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 Because you're shooting. That's our little sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> because you've shot um, some educational programming tied to cooking and teaching kids healthy meals, right. choices. and um, That was a grant. Yeah. Yeah. So one of those things came to be where we have this big open space but nothing in it all right we didn't have these tables and chairs we didn't have these countertops we didn't have uh, rolling tabletops we didn't have robotic cameras we didn't have any appliances and that sink was on the other side of the wall well the first thing I did and not knowing anything would happen next was that was their break room on the other side of the wall so I said, when we moved in here, I asked the landlord, can you put that sink on this side of the wall? He said, what do you want a sink in the middle of a conference room? I said, well, we might need water and things. <laughs> All along thinking, <laughs> if I could just build out from this sink, we could have a kitchen studio. Mm -hmm. Because that's one thing that people like to do. They like to learn how to cook, sure. and they like to learn how to do things. And So it started that way. And then uh, working with uh, a grant, which was a grant that was an ongoing grant that we'd already been a little part of, um, we had a bigger, bigger role because we were documenting the grant. That was our partnership with that. And the grant helped us populate this because they needed this for their grant because it was a grant that was teaching nutrition and good cooking and healthy lifestyle and movement. And so that grant went on that way and we, we, we were part of it. My wife was running the grant, and she said, hey, I want to document this grant. I know someone that can help us do that. <laughs> and I said, hey, <laughs> I'd like some money <laughs> so I can build this all the parts studio to do what you would need to do. So all of that came together. But it, I mean, I'm some, making it simplistic, but I worked with the uh, people at Home Depot, and that's where, this is actually the same countertop I have at home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that countertop. It's nice. Uh, so, uh, we worked with them and uh, all of this was purchased so it, the, the, the top that's there that normally sits where we are uh, is on wheels so it can roll around and move to different locations so we could transport parts of the kitchen if we went on location. So that was the point. There wasn't such a thing made then to be able to transport it. So we made this so we could transport it but if they were here well, they could do their cooking here and they could accommodate uh, an audience an audi yeah. out here. So. They bought the tables and chairs, they bought the countertops and the appliances, and they bought, helped us buy some of the cameras. We had some and they bought some, and we had the controlling parts of the cameras already because we already had a few of those. So basically everything in this room came from a grant we didn't expend the money for. A testament to that perseverance that we started talking about at the beginning of the interview. We have a little, few minutes left and I ask, want to ask one more question. Okay. Where do you see this organization going after you leave on June 30th, which will be 20 years to the day of you being executive director? Oh, I see it uh, having to evolve, like I said, in terms of the way uh, the information is consumed. Part of the sticking point with this is, and part of the, the issue with this is, uh, we get no money from our franchise agreement for internet. So that's why we haven't made the streaming more robust. That's why we haven't built up any of that. So we have to find a way to, to su make sustainability out of us being on the internet, because that's where we're being consumed, and that's where people are looking for things. And that's where, if you're going to provide good streaming quality, it has to pay for itself. It can't come out of this budget, because this is for the air. Right. This is not what that is designed for. It's never been for that. It's been for these channels. The other way would maybe be to look at how to get these channels consumed in a, in a place where they can be consumed <laughs> on a place like Hulu. And there is a possibility that that can happen. So to take our content programming, which was normally only on channels, to put it in a format that be can, can consumed either with one of these set-top boxes or something else. And then purchased per program type thing is what you're purchased thinking? Purchased per program or subsidized or underwritten in some way. 
I'm sure people would be willing to do that considering we have 20 years of showing that we can do it and that we can do it well. It's not like we're sitting in a closet somewhere with a little video camera and, a, and an internet mic and we're doing podcasts. Yeah. We can do blowout stuff because we're doing production. We've done production. We've perfected production for this right now. So it would only be a matter of putting it in a form somebody could consume it. But you want to do that in the, in the best way you can so that we'd be willing to pay for that consumption or underwrite it so that it could be available for free. It has to be paid for. And uh, you, can't, you don't want to steal from your uh, reason that you're here, your mission. I've stayed true to that mission from, from the start of, of uh, where I've been here. And, uh, and the mi mission being providing local programming to the local community that right. it's a part of, is that right? That's absolutely right. Providing the access to the public. Uh, I, I believe in, in that freedom of speech idea that belongs to us. I believe that this station belongs to the community and I've, I've stuck to the mission from the original board of directors to make sure access is given to the community that is paying for it, that lives in it, that is affected by it. And this is what's been going on all this time. And uh, I've done this my whole life and didn't even realize I've been doing it. I, I was in the Coast Guard. I served the nation in the Coast Guard for protecting people's rights. And I end up serving in this facility protecting their rights here. And people of this community, yeah. Right. So that's what it's all been about. And I didn't even make the connection. I was doing sort of the same thing, protecting those rights of people. And uh, so that's what I've been doing all this time. So my thinking and my hope is that mission continues to to give the education along with it because we also train people to do this it isn't we do it for you we train you to do it and then empower you to own the content of what you're doing so we don't want to own the content we don't want to do TV for ourselves we already know how to do that that's not what we're here to do we're here to train you how to do it to give you the empowered uh, ability to you own the content you own a crew, you can bring people in here, we'll train them. Everybody gets literacy on top of the access. And it's open to everybody. Anyone can get involved, right? right. Anybody in the, who lives or works in the city of Pittsfield, the subscribers pay for this. It comes through a franchise fee. It's not government funded. It now completely passes through. It wasn't at one time, but now it completely passes through. Uh, and it's used exactly for what it's purpose for, and it's very transparent. And what's the quickest and easiest way for someone who's watching this and says, hey, I think I have a show idea. I want to get involved. How do they do that? They just call us or they can find us online and say, hey, I'd like to find out about your operation and I'd like to join uh, your membership and do produce programming. That's all you have to do uh, because uh, it all depends upon what you want to do, not what we want to do. You tell us what you'd like to do and we'll help you do it. Uh, that's really what it is. It's sort of like the Peace Corps. Uh, we got the tools uh, and we'll teach you how to dig the ditch. <laughs> and we'll tell you how deep to make it and how long and uh, you gotta to, bring for the, the sweat. purpose. You gotta but bring you got to bring the person <laughs> they're going to dig, dig the holes. So. And, it's, and it's a rare opportunity for people to get a chance, to, for people to gain an, an understanding yes. of what it takes to produce a TV yes, show. Yes, it does. And I think then you, you take an appreciation for it. Because, it, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to be down on broadcasters, but broadcasters do programming and they do it for advertising dollars and they're a for-profit business. We are not doing this for money. We're doing this for the pure uh, reason that I explained, that we're doing it to give you access and give you literacy. So there's no profit to be made. It's a non-profit organization. Well, congratulations on the work that you have done. Enjoy retirement coming up <laughs> in a few days. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, Bernie Valley, thanks so much. Executive Director Thank of Kidsfield Community Television. Thank Great to chat you. with you. Thank you.